the morning. This is after he's worked the full day. He's there and he's got this whole big like Ouija board with checkers on the board and each checker was marked with a team and the dates and then the conflicts with what they might have because every stadium then was shared by baseball. And there would be this guy moving all these things around and he said he wanted to achieve a thing which they all talk about today is, he said by mid-season, I want to make sure that the strong and the weak have almost the same record. So when he was called by the Associated Press, he was asked, well, what about the NFL? What are you doing for parity? And he said, prophetically, on any given Sunday, any team can beat any other team. That's still repeated 100 years later. And my brother did before he died. He really, he owns that. And yet, think about it. If I were to go to a major company anywhere, I went to UMass and said, listen, I can fund your whole football team. What do you want, $100 million? Mm -hmm. And every company uses that slogan. Every Sunday, you will hear it at one time or another. That's how much he saw way, way in the future. And I think that's really what his gift was, that, that he was like a computer. You could ask him any, they have one of these memories that, that you couldn't believe. He, he would remember, if I came in and said, you know, I'm sorry for so-and-so, yeah, he'd say, I remember you did that 10 years ago. He just really knew and had that type of mind. Oh, <laughs> And then, of course, we want to get to some of your career. And you're working at the Baltimore Colts. Over in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but you start in the ticket office. You work up to head scout. And you're there in the heyday of John Unitas. You're at two NFL championships, two Super Bowls. Um, your beautiful Super Bowl five ring is out there on display. Can you tell us what it was like to you know, be there, especially in the 60s? Well, they, they had just, I had just gone on, my father dropped dead at a football game right in that October of that year. And so... 1959. 1959. And ironically, the owner of the Colts, Carol Rosenblum, again, back to kind of the strangeness of life, back in, in the 20s, Carol Rosenblum was one of the best running backs at Penn. And he and a guy by the name of Marty Brill had decided they had enough of the coaching. They, did, they didn't want to spend one more moment at Penn. Brill went to Notre Dame and, and came back a year later and beat the hell out of Penn. But he said to Rosenblum, he said, you know, Carol, your future is here. Your family business is in Maryland. You're around Philadelphia. Don't go. And Rosenblum didn't go. So when, when the Colts were to come back to Baltimore after failing everywhere, he went to Rosenblum and he said, I need somebody to bring this team back and, and be able to fund it. You know, they had gone out of business and everything. So long story short, Rosenblum buys the team. Rosenblum's greatest friends are the Kennedys. I mean, he is it in Baltimore. So when my father died, he said, come down here, kid, and start. You can start at the bottom and work your way up. So I did. I went, went down. And my first assignment might have been the best I ever had in life. He would call me on a Friday. I worked in the ticket office after going to training camp, seeing the greatest of the air. Unitas, I still say, is he and Brady are the two greatest I've ever seen. So Rosenblum would call on Friday and say, up he said, uh, I need you to go to the White House. He said, you've got the Colt wagon. I want you to go buy some sneakers and, and get some footballs. And I said, why, Mr. Rosenblum, what do you want me to do there? He said, oh, the pen, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> Repeat it to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. His fiance, Tracy, over here, I finally, I finally met Jack's girlfriend, my grandson, Jack, who goes to school here. Peter, my grandson, just graduated from school. And of course, 
Mr. Schmidt here, the most, the most famous of famous of famous. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Martin, one of our great novelists and writers right here, and, and his wife, Chris. Ron Borges of the, of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, wrote it, and just inducted, and a little round of applause, as I think he's, I think he's probably the greatest boxing writer of the last 50 or 60 years, just inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. So, and, and of course, John Harrison is here. He's a Mount Auburn's really bird watcher, among many other things. <laughs> Jeff Bourne, who worked at, at Fox, I won't hold it against him, but it wasn't the real Fox. No, it Fox wasn't. <laughs> Great career with, with Fox, and now the news director at ACMI. And of course, finally, my wife, Joanne O'Neill. I will tell you something about her. She always blushes, but anyway. Just shows you how far women have come in sports and everything. But a wonderful director here right now is that Joanne wrote all 27 teams back in 1967, 68, 69, out of college, asking for a position. No women apply in pro football then. Finally, the team of my closest friend, Don Shula, hired Joanne O'Neill. She is the first woman executive in pro football. She's so shy, she won't tell you, but. <laughs> and again, I, I, I do want to finally say, this collection, Joanne's worked very hard on a lot of other people, <clears throat> but this collection would not be where it is without Kirsten. She's oh, incredible. It's a 5,000 story. She probably goes home and, and, and tells her family, oh my God, not another one. <laughs> and, and all of the stuff she's put on there. Outstanding. I couldn't be in better hands. So thank you all. Great. So, love to invite everyone out to uh, to the main lobby. Where there's a great display, and uh, help yourself to, to food and beverage in the, the Hunt Hospitality Room. And uh, let's cheer on the men to a victory today. All right, go UMass. Yeah.